So I want to talk to you about stoicism and skepticism, even though that's not normally the way people think about stoicism. They, the, the normal approach to stoicism is you're interested in stoicism if you're interested in ethics. In fact, if you're interested in the kind of things we just heard from, uh, from Spiro. But in this case, actually, it turns out that there is a long tradition, not just among the Stoics, but in general in, in ancient Greek and Roman uh, philosophy about what we call skepticism, uh, skepticism about, you know, yeah. knowledge claims and things like that. that. So that's what we're going to talk about in the next few minutes. Okay. Um, let me actually start my counter so yeah. that I know. There's somebody who's talking in the background. If you could uh, please mute yourself. Thank you. Okay. I'll get to Marcus Aurelius in a minute. But first, let me give you a little bit of background. First of all, what do the Stoics have to do with skepticism? Well, it turns out that skepticism with a capital S was actually an ancient philosophy, right? And they came in a num number of different uh, um, uh, varieties flav or flavors. The two big ones are Pyrrhonism and academic skepticism. Pyrrhonism held that no, that human beings should have no opinion whatsoever because, because human knowledge is impossible. The academic skeptics were a little bit more uh, moderate and they held that we should uh, have our opinions, but, but we should hold them very lightly because again, it's very likely that we're gonna be wrong. That's Pyrrho on the left side. Uh, he was a radical skeptic, if you will. And then Carneades of the academic school after Plato was a moderate skeptic. Somebody that we actually, as modern skeptics, we, we would, uh, we would relate to. In fact, I, I suggest that people look into Carneades because he had to say a lot of the kinds of things that we modern skeptics still use, a lot of the kinds of, uh, uh, of uh, general ideas that were still at the basis of the modern skeptic movement. Speaking of which, the modern skeptic movement has it, its roots in two people, David Hume and uh, Pierre-Simon de Laplace, both of, of them living in, you know, somewhere around the 18th century. Um, in the inquiry concerning human understanding, Hume wrote, a wise man proportions his belief to the evidence. Similarly, in the Theorie Analytique de Probabilité, um, Laplace said, the weight of evidence for, for an extraordinary claim must be proportional. Now, you probably are familiar with this kind of thought because these are, these are David Hume on the left and Laplace on the, on the right because those are the basic, the basic idea that gave origin to the modern co the contemporary skeptic movement. Uh, you probably heard the phrase, an extraordinary claim requires extraordinary proof. That was Marcello Truzzi um, in the very first issue of what was used to be called the Zetetic Scholar, which was the name that uh, initially had, uh, was given to what we today know it, known as the Skeptical Inquirer. The second quote is probably more famous. It's Carl Sagan from Broca's Brain, uh, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. But basically, uh, Sagan is simply popularized the uh, Trutzi's uh, take on things, and Trutzi himself was actually, in fact, based on David Hume. The general idea is not just that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, but the more basic idea that David Hume put forth, that is, that there has to be a proportionality between your beliefs and your evidence. Beliefs, in other words, come in a range of, thing, of, of you know, degrees. Uh, we, it's not just yes or no. I have a, you know, somewhat of a belief about certain things, a moderate belief about certain things. I'm not so sure. And then I have a higher degree of belief about other things. And the notion that, that Hume put forth is that the degree to which you believe something rationally from a rational perspective ha uh, ought to be proportional to the evidence. An extreme version of that belief is the Trutzi Sagan uh, notion that, of course, if you're talking about extraordinary beliefs, such as, you know, paranormal beliefs, astrology, and things like that, then the evidence ought to be com commensurately extraordinary. Now, skepticism really did start with the, with the, with the ancients, but even in fact, before Pyrrho, uh, the, the first skeptic that I can, that I could find uh, on record in the Western tradition, at least, was Socrates. In one of the Platonic dialogues, the Carmides, Socrates actually asks, uh, what is the difference between a quack and a, and a doctor? And he, he concludes that it's really difficult to tell the difference. He says, so the wise person won't be able to distinguish the man who pretends to be a doctor, but isn't, from the man who really and truly is one, or indeed to distinguish any other of those who know from any other of those who don't know, unless he's an expert himself. 
this is in fact a, the problem of expertise is, is still today with us today in modern discussions in, in uh, epistemology uh, and in, in modern philosophy. Uh, it's like, you know, how, how do you know that you should trust this expert or, or that expert? How do you know, how do you, made the, you know, tell the difference between an expert and a quack? And it's something that we all still struggle with. Uh, there, are, there have been a number of suggestions in modern philosophy. Those are not the ones that I'm going to get into today, however. But that was just to show you that the, the, the question is, in fact, pretty, pretty ancient. And there is Socrates right there. So now back to the Stoics, before I get to actually Marcus Aurelius, who is really the, the one that I want to talk about in the last bit of this, of this talk. That's Zeno, Citium, modern day Cyprus. Zeno was the founder of the Stoic, uh, Stoic philosophy. It's important to realize that the Stoics called themselves Socratics. That is, they thought that they were simply following Socrates in their philosophy. And that is one of the reasons they were actually interested in epistemology. Uh, that is the study of, of knowledge claims. And a study of epistemology, of course, is something that we all should be interested in as, as skeptics because theories of knowledge and understanding of what counts as knowledge, what doesn't count as knowledge, are fundamental uh, for, a, for a modern skeptic. Now, here's a, a fairly long quote, which I broke down in, in several, in a couple of slides, in several sections, because it's important. It's essentially a summary given by Cicero, uh, later, later on, a few centuries after Zeno, of Stoic epistemology, and particularly, particularly of how Zeno thought about degrees of knowledge. So not only belief comes in degrees, but knowledge, according to Zeno, comes in, in degrees. And so uh, Cicero says, uh, Zeno professed to illustrate this, this notion that um, knowledge comes in degrees by a piece of action. For when he stretched out his fingers, you have to, you, will, you, you should try to do it yourself, you know, it's with your own uh, right hand or left hand, whichever it is. When you, he stretched out his fingers and showed the palm of his hand, perception said, it's a thing like this. So the beginning of any kind of knowledge that we have uh, is perception, okay? The Stoics in that sense were empiricists. Uh, they, they said, look, there is no knowledge unless you can actually perceive things in the world. Okay? But perception is a very low degree of knowledge because perception can be incorrect for a number of, of, of reasons, can be misinterpreted for a number of reasons. So the first degree is perception. That corresponds to the open palm of his hand. Then when he had a little closed his fingers, ascent is like this. Ascent is a, is a technical Stoic term that basically indicates judgment of perception. Right. So, for instance, I walk across the, the Central Park and on the other side, I see, I see Spiro and, uh, and I start getting closer because ah, it'd be nice to, to say hi to my friend. And then I get closer and it turns out he's not Spiro. It's just somebody who looks like Spiro from a distance. Right. So the initial perception turned out to be incorrect. And so I deny assent to the initial perception after uh, additional information, uh, additional uh, you know, thinking and, and, and evaluating the situation, it turns out that was not spirit. So, so ascent is a little higher degree of knowledge because you actually have to have an, arrive at an explicit judgment about whether your perception is correct or not. Afterwards, when he had completely closed his hand and held forth his fist, that, he said, was comprehension, for which seemingly he also gave that state a name which it had not, been, uh, not before and called it catalepsis. A cataleptic impression is a particularly strong kind of impression. And uh, for instance, give me, let me give you, and we all have them. Let me give you an, 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 an example. So it's about, what is it, 3.15 in the afternoon here in New York. So the sun is still high uh, because sunset is about in an hour, a little bit more than an hour and 15 minutes. So if you went outside and, and you, were, you tried to, to convince yourself right now that it is night, that it's the middle of the night, you just couldn't. You can, you can reason your way through this thing as much as you want. You can think of, you know, brains in a, maybe on a brain in a vat, maybe you live in a, in a simulation, whatever it is. The fact is, you're not going to seriously be able to convince yourself that it is night. Why not? Because you're having a cataleptic impression. You're having the, the kind of really strong impression, this essentially uh, sensorial impression, that is essentially undeniable. Could you be hallucinating? Sure. Um, but save for hallucination and drug trips, you know, your cataleptic impressions are actually important. You need to keep them under, under uh, good advisement because they're very strong. They're, your judgment there is on solid grounds. And finally, when he brought his left hand against his right and with it took a firm and tight hold of his fist, knowledge, he said, was of that character and that was what none by but a wise man 
possessed. Okay, so the highest degree of knowledge, what the, the Stoics actually called proper knowledge proper, is is on, is is only the, the uh, they thought uh, uh, very difficult to achieve, and so only you know particularly smart, particularly wise people actually achieve that kind of sort of semi certainty. So if you look at all these things together, it turns out that there is a degree, uh, uh, you know, hierarchy of degrees of knowledge. The lowest level is perception. Ascent is a little higher, catalepsis is even higher, and knowledge proper is even higher. And who does or what, what allows us to have these kinds of degrees of knowledge? Well, perception is a result of unreflective or instinctual uh, uh, understanding of things. Ascent is a result of actual deliberate reflection when you think about your, your perceptions. Catalepsis is the kind of undeniable, really strong perception that I talked about. And then finally, knowledge is achieved either by the sage, which is the ideal human being, the perfect reasoner, or, the, the Stoics said, by scientific knowledge. That is, by actual agreement uh, of a large community of people who are experts in a, in a, certain, uh, in a certain area. So that's what, we're, what we want, essentially, right? ideally. But a lot of the degrees of knowledge that most of the times we are faced with are not that high. And now let me turn to, to Marcus. In the Meditations uh, is his famous book, and it was actually a personal philosophical diary. Uh, he, he wrote it to himself. Um, it was not meant for publication, uh, but it has, it, it's an interesting uh, you know, window into the mind of a Roman emperor and the mind of a Stoic, because he was a practicing uh, Stoic. And there are a number of things there that Marcus says, says that are still valuable today. Most of them had to do with ethics, with, eth with behavior. Uh, with how to behave in society and how to behave with other people. But some of them actually have to do with epistemology and, and therefore, therefore they are of concern, I think, to uh, skeptics. So what I'm gonna do now is to give you a series of, of quotes and then explain what exactly Marcus means by that. And then at the end, we'll, we'll have one more slide where I kind of summarize the, the advice, which I think it's good advice still to almost 2000 years later for modern skeptics. So the first quote says, do what is necessary and whatever the reason of a social animal naturally requires and as it requires. Uh, here, this, Marcus is actually saying something that goes to, the, to what Spiro was talking about a few minutes ago. That is, we should always try to do things that are pro-social, that help the human cosmopolis, that help, that help society at large. And that goes also for skeptics. So why should we be interested in skepticism? Why should we be going around, uh, you know, criticizing certain notions or endorsing other notions? Not because we want to be smug, not because we want to feel ourselves superior or particularly intelligent, because we want to improve the human cosmopolis, right? So skepticism matters because it improves society. Uh, fighting against, you know, anti-vaccination nonsense, it's not just because you want to feel smarter than the anti-vaxxers. If that's the reason you do it, that you, then you're doing it for the wrong reason. You should do it for the reason that Marcus says here, because we are social animals and we should do whatever reason requires of social animals. Second, set yourself in motion if it is in your power and do not look about, about you to see if anyone will observe it. Nor yet expect Plato's Republic but we be content if the smallest thing goes on well and consider such an event to be no small matter. Uh, in ancient times, don't expect for Plato's Republic was the equivalent of the modern version of, you know, don't wait for utopia to appear. You don't, don't wait until everything is perfect. Don't wait until, uh, you know, you, you need to act right here, right now, because it matters. And even though sometimes you get frustrated because we feel that we're not making much of an impact or we're making a tiny impact, Marcus says, be content even if the smallest thing goes well, because that's important. You're making, you're making a difference, right? So this is something to remember because often skepticism is kind of a, you know, dispiriting uh, sort of approach because you, you keep being surrounded by people who, who endorse all sorts of nonsense and you kind of say, what the hell am I doing here? Why, why am I bothering with all this? Well, you're bothering because it is your duty as a, human, as a social human being and because in fact, it does make a difference even at a small level. Next, accustom yourself to attend carefully to what is said by another, and as much as it is possible, try to inhabit the speaker's mind. This is very good advice. The notion here is like, you know, don't, don't dismiss other people because they're country bumpkins, idiots, ignorance, et cetera. They may or may not be, you don't really know. Um, but the fact is, unless you understand why they're saying what they're saying, you're not gonna, make, you're not gonna be likely to make much progress, essentially, right? So, so step back for a second, and instead of dismissing other people, not, not dismissing other people doesn't mean you have to agree. Uh, not at all. Actually understand what they're saying 
uh, so that, uh, that you use that understanding as a guide to respond appropriately or in the most efficacious way possible. They are certainly moved toward things because they suppose them to be suitable to their nature and profitable to them, but it is not so. Teach them then and show them without being angry. There's a lot in these quotes. So he says, look, re recognize that other people don't say, don't endorse you know, bizarre notions or, 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 or uh, untruth notions because they want to be bizarre or untrue. They think it's true, okay? No matter how bizarre and untenable a particular notion, whoever others that notion usually thinks that it is true, right? So they're misguided, they're not evil, in other words, most of them, there may be some exceptions, but, but the overwhelming majority, they're just misguided, okay? And so when you say, well, but that they're wrong, it's like, yeah, okay, fine, they, they may be wrong, but then if they're wrong, your duty is twofold. First of all, to try to teach them, you know, try to explain to them why they're wrong. And to do so, importantly, without getting angry or upset or anything like that, it's like, you know, you, you do it because it's the right thing to do. And then if sometimes it works, a lot of the times it doesn't work, uh, but that's the way the world, uh, the world, work, the world goes on and, and you don't need to be upset. In fact, if you get upset, you kind of you defeat your own purpose. When you're offended with any man's shameless conduct, immediately ask yourself, is it possible then that, sh that shameless men should not be in the world? It is not possible. Do not then require what is impossible. So, you know, very often I, I catch, I caught myself several times, you know, say, I can't believe that these people believe, you know, that creationists believe this thing, or I can't believe that there are anti-vaxxers in the world. So, what do you mean you can't believe it? It's real, it's happening, it's right in front of your eyes. So can't believe it doesn't give you, doesn't lead you anywhere. That kind of frustration is very, is not helpful. Why do you expect, uh, you know, people not to, endorse uh, bizarre beliefs or paranormal beliefs or true scientific beliefs. You know that that is the case. You know that a fairly large percentage of the population does endorse that kind of belief. So why on earth are you shocked and, and, and you know, and uh, uh, somehow surprised by what's going on? Don't, don't be surprised. Just, just take the world for what it is. We don't live, again, in Plato's Republic. We don't live in an ideal world. We live in the real world and we have to, do with, to de deal with real people. I have, a lot of teachers have an analogous version of this when you teach, you don't teach the students you wish you had, you teach the students you actually have, right? And usually there is a discrepancy there. You, you love to have students who are always responsible, interesting, interactive, and so on and so forth, and you know, knowledgeable, but all of the, a lot of the times you don't. And you don't teach to that first kind of imaginary student, you teach to the ones you actually have because you wanna make their lives better because you wanna actually make a difference, okay? Consider that you also do many things wrong and that you are a man like others. And even if you do abstain from certain faults, still you have the disposition to commit them. This is like, okay, also don't get too cocky because you yourself probably subscribe to notions that are not really particularly rational, particularly defensible, that have turned out to be wrong and so on and so forth. So you, you're prone to make the same kind of mistakes. Maybe not to the extent of a creationist, certainly not about you know, evolution versus creation, but maybe about something else. We are all human beings. We're all fallible as the original skeptics uh, kept reminding us. And so we should actually hold to our opinion, our opinion in, in, with a little bit of a lightness, right? Because that way you, let, you can let them go more easily. It's difficult, to, trust me. We, we all know how difficult it is, right? We get, uh, there's a lot of research in social psychology that tells us that we get really attached, emotionally attached to our opinions. All of us, not just the creationists or the anti-maxists, skeptics included. Um, and yet, one of the good things about practicing, you know, critical thinking is precisely to remind yourself that you may be just as attached, you may be just as fallible uh, uh, as, as other people that you criticize so easily. Let me give you one bonus quote before we summarize, and then I will, I'd like to have some kind of uh, Q&A uh, to, so that that's going to be a little bit more, more uh, dynamic. This is from Epictetus. Epictetus was another Stoic philosopher. In fact, he was a major influence on Marcus Aurelius. And in the Enchiridion, the, his manual for a good life, he says, whenever anyone criticizes or wrongs you, remember that they are only doing or saying what they think is right. They cannot be guided by your views, only their own. So if their views are wrong, they are the ones who suffer insofar as they are misguided. I mean, if someone declares a true conjunctive proposition to be false, the proposition is unaffected. It is they who come off worse for having their ignorance exposed. So what is he saying? So first of all, as I said before, uh, because Marcus also has the same thought, like most people 
don't say wrong things on purpose. They say them because they think they're right. Now, who is losing at that point? They are the ones losing, not the notion of truth that they're denying, right? Uh, when Epictetus here says, if someone declares a true conjun conjunction proposition, conjunctive proposition to be false, it's not the conjunctive proposition that, is, uh, that, is, uh, that comes out worse off. It's the person who makes the mistake. Conjunctive proposi proposition, by the way, is, is one of those things like A is true and B is true. So the conjunctive proposition is true only if A and B are both true, right? So if you declare something that is actually a true conjuncting proposition to be false, you are the one that is making the mistake. You are the one that should be embarrassed, not the proposition, not the truth. That's Epictetus right there. And so let me therefore summarize the points that Marcus has brought up. Our priority should be to be useful to humanity. That's just remember, that's why we're doing this thing, right? We're not doing it to feel good, to pat ourselves on the back, on the back to, to inflate our ego. All of those are bad reason, reasons for doing it. We're doing it because we want to be helpful to other people. Even if we make um, a small difference, it matters, right? I mean, I've debated, for instance, years ago, creation is years after year after year. And I, I kind of was kind of dispirited. It's like, this is not going anywhere. And yet... Still today, many years later, I get emails saying, you know, I was at that debate many years ago and you kind of, you, you helped me change my mind. It didn't happen on the spot. It happened years or, or later, but that was one of the trigger, trigger points. And, you know, th these things happen. We do make a difference. We should listen to others and try to understand them. Uh, for one thing, because this is an, uh, it's a good rhetorical strategy, right? If you don't understand the, the other person's uh, argument, then you're not going to be able to counter that argument effectively. But more importantly, you should, you should listen because these are fellow human beings. They're just misguided. These are not evil people. They're just misguided. Other people, too, think that they're right. Again, right? You're not the only one. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody's right. This is not a, this is not a call for uh, epistemic relativism. Oh, well, they think they're right, I'm thinking I'm right, so, so it's, you know, any, anything goes. No, anything doesn't go, certainly not in the, in the realm of scientific knowledge. Um, but we should remind ourselves that other people also think that they're right. We should teach other people or endure them without losing our patience, right? So there are, these are the two approaches. The first one, you explain things, and then if, if that doesn't work, you just endure the other person. It's like, okay, I did my best. And once I did my best, what else can I do? That's it. Don't act surprised where the, at the fact that there are irrational people in the world or even smart people who say irrational things. There's all sorts of smart people who sometimes just fall, say things that are like, how did you come up with that? Uh, that is not surprising. You should not be surprised. We should not be, therefore, astonished by it. Remember also that on occasion, of course, we too behave irrationally, right? If not about this particular topic, then certainly about something else. And finally, what Epictetus just said, the truth is not affected by people spreading uh, speaking falsehoods. So we should always remember that there is, uh, you know, the fault when somebody, the problem when somebody says something is not true is with the person, not with the truth itself. And allow me a shameless plug for a couple of my books. If you want to know more about stoicism, the book on the left might be useful. If you want to know about more, more about pseudoscience and especially what is called virtue epistemology, which is what we kind of talked about in the background, uh, you know, a good, interesting approach to epistemology, to understanding things and to teaching other people about things, uh, then the book on the right could be uh, your thing. Uh, and that's it. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention. I hope that we're going to have a few minutes. I, I took 23 minutes, so we should have a yeah, few minutes. Uh, you, we, have, we have a good like five, we have a good like six minutes actually for, for questions. So uh, does anyone who wants to raise, raise their hand on the, uh, uh, on the uh, participant menu? Is a participant, okay, we have Bernard is the first to raise his hand. Bernard, unmute yourself and ask. Away. Yes, hi. Uh, <laughs> Massimo, thanks so much. I, I remember having this conversation with your colleague, uh, Greg Lopez, about uh, I recently was a volunteer. I've done some volunteers as a clinic escort at uh, abortion clinics. And the, 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 the people that are there protesting you know, abortion, I mean, my own personal view is that any woman who seeks an abortion should be able to have one. If it needs to be free, that's fine. But I find it so difficult to deal with these protesters. And mostly, I, I just find it 
I can't believe that they really think we should, you know, outlaw abortion. I mean, what? I mean, so the hardest part of it is just approaching the, the task of escorting the women in a stoic way, like, you know, and not not hating the protesters. <laughs> it's no, frankly the no, I, I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. So, and that is that is one reason, however, the Stoics uh, thought that, and they're not the only ones, Buddhists think in a very similar fashion, that we should uh, train ourselves to deal with those kind of situations ahead of time. You know, one of, one of the things that actually does help is an exercise called the Premeditatio Malorum, which translates loosely, loosely from Latin as thinking ahead about bad shit happening. And uh, what you do is, before you're doing something like that, like escorting women to, a, to an abortion clinic, for instance, you take a few minutes to close your mind and visualize the scene and prepare yourself mentally, basically, for what's gonna, what you know it's going to happen. And uh, there is plenty of evidence from modern psychology, we don't have to trust the Stoics, uh, that that actually does help. That if you do that on a regular basis, uh, you know, prepare mind reacts better to those kind of situations. If you tell yourself initially, you know, before you go there, it's like, okay, I know these people are misguided, but they're not bad people. We just have a disagreement. Yes, it's a disagreement that have major consequences for people's lives and, and well-being, but they're trying their best. So I'm going to try to think about, about them as trying to do their best. But by the same token, I am trying my best as well. And therefore, I need to do what needs to be done without, without getting upset. Okay. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. And our next question comes from Jesse Phillips. Jesse. Hey, hey, thanks, Massimo. Loved um, the presentation. And I love Stoic philosophy and a lot of those tenets you said at the end. I mean, I, I think about how powerful that would be if our political discourse could include those when, when trying to discuss policy and, and, and where, you know, uh, how we want to um, politic. And what I, my, my perspective is oftentimes what happens is our own um, emotions as evolutionary you know, former uh, hunters and gatherers and tribal beings, even if we know that that Stoic philosophy um, oftentimes prevents us from practicing it and, and has us regress into this tribal uh, emotional state. And I'm interested because you're also an evolutionary biologist. Um, if you have any good practical ways to combine both the philosophy and the emotional intelligence where we can try to make progress and, and move forward? I know that's a real, very big question, but would love to hear any reactions. Yeah, it is, a, it is a big question. There are, non, there are a number of exercises that um, you can find in the, early, in the ancient Stoic literature, and some of them have been refined uh, and updated on the basis of modern scientific evidence. Uh, Stoicism, for instance, is one of the philosophies, it is the philosophy that uh, influenced um, uh, modern cognitive behavioral therapy, which is one of the best evidence-based type of therapy. It started out in the early 60s, and the, the two of the people that, that studied it out, um, Albert Ellis and Adam Beck, were actually influenced by Epictetus, Marcus Aurelius, and people like that. And now there is a fairly sizable uh, uh, you know, literature about these kind of mind, mindful ex exercises in mindfulness. Um, they, do, they do help. Uh, the, the thing that I find most interesting from modern cognitive science that, that is uh, in agreement with, but of course improves uh, significantly on the, on the early Stoic insights is this notion that emotions are not actually separate from, 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 from uh, rational thinking. That is, it's not like our mind has two, our brain has two different components, one of which is emotional and the other one is, is uh, rational. Um, it's actually all highly interconnected. While it is true that anatomically speaking, our emotional reactions are mostly located in the amygdala, for instance, and our uh, rational thinking is a matter for the, for the uh, neocortex. The fact is that these two areas are massively interconnected. They talk to, constantly to each other. So what, that, what follows from that? It follows that emotion, we should think of emotions as being made of, of at least a couple of components. One is what sometimes referred to as a proto-emotion, and it is completely uncontrollable. You cannot do anything about it. For instance, you hear a very loud noise in the street and all of a sudden and you jump, right? That kind of reaction, that kind of fear reaction is not controllable. And it's probably a good thing because it probably will save your life. Uh, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's part of the, your fight or flight response. However, what we call the mature emotions or the, the fully formed emotions have inevitably a component part, 
oh, I heard the noise. No, so now I'm starting thinking, oh, of course I heard the noise because this is a bad neighborhood and I'm sure there is somebody who's about to kill me. That's one interpretation. The other one is, oh, I heard a noise. Sure, it's night. There's probably a cat that, that, you know, that, that was uh, going around the street and, and overturning things. So how you think about your, your, how you have con your cognition about your initial responses is what actually leads you then to develop an, uh, one or another emotional response. And then the idea that both the Stoics and the cognitive behavioral therapists have is that we should train ourselves to respond uh, in a calm cognitive fashion to certain kinds of, 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 uh, of situations. So that, and, and you can achieve that by uh, meditating, by uh, there are different kinds of meditations uh, other than the Buddhist one, uh, by preparing yourself mentally for these kinds of situations. You know, part of the problem is you say, you know, when, when you get in a situation, in the, in, you're in the middle of a situation, you, 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 sometimes that get, catches you unprepared. Right. But the analogy there is, you know, you don't start training in boxing, let's say, the moment in which you had to get into the ring and have actually the fight, right? You start training much earlier. And so it's the training that allows you to prepare yourself for these situations. People shouldn't think about, uh, you know, just opening a book about stoicism, reading about stuff and say, okay, now I got it. I'm ready to, you know, to not get it ever. Ups I'll never be upset again, or I'll never be angry again. It's, no, that's not, it doesn't work that way, right? No more than you go into, into a gym, you look around at, at the weights and you say, oh yeah, now I developed all my muscles because now I know how to use weights. And it doesn't, you know, it doesn't, it requires actual effort, constant effort practice. Uh, year after year. All right. Well, that's the that's all the time we have officially for live Q and A, but we are on break. So uh, for, for about uh, I'd say ten minutes or so. So if uh, if uh, I guess Peter Florm and Joel G, if you can just uh, if if, you, if you'd like to ask Mazimo, uh, I, I guess you could now do, do so anyway. Other but. Um, uh, you know, but that's that. We'll, we'll, we will commence with our next uh, presenter in about 10 minutes. Okay, if, uh, since it's sort of unofficially been, been invited to ask. I mean, I think, you know, that's, it's, in most cases, it's perfectly correct, I think, to try to approach everything calmly. But I think there's times when rage is the only appropriate reaction. And I'll avoid using Hitler. Let's say you use uh, Simon Legree to take a fictional slave master. Uh, the appropriate reaction is rage. And you could be to say, oh, well, you know, he has his own point of view when he's beating the shit out of all his slaves and raping whoever he feels like it. Sorry, but no, he doesn't. I mean, yeah, he does, but his point of view is completely illegitimate. Uh, and I think the key is, how do you distinguish the people who really are evil from the people with whom you just disagree? But there really are evil people in the world. I mean, at least I have no trouble saying that some people are evil. Uh, yeah. Is it and, bad if you are an evil person? Well, if I am in it, you know, I don't know if there's anyone who goes out and deliberately does evil things. That is, if you look at whatever, Hitler, Idi Amin, whoever, they didn't go out and say, oh, what could I do that's the most evil thing I can think of? Right. They thought right. they were doing things for the good of uh, their right. countries. Which, that's right, which means that there are no evil people. Um, and, you know, they're only misguided people. Now, some of these people are massively dis misguided, and we should stop them uh, before they do the, what, what, they're, what they're doing. Um, but no, I, I reject, um, I guess, the, the notion that there is such a thing as a proper rage um and for for two reasons first of all i'm not the only one and the stoics are not the only ones there is this really interesting example you didn't want to bring up either but i will uh there's this interesting example of uh, a colleague of mine uh, owen flanagan who interviewed the dalai lama and uh, flanagan said uh you know so so if i had a time machine and i could go back in time and kill hitler should i not do it and more importantly shouldn't i not be uh, enraged by what hitler uh, was about to do, and that would be my motivation for killing him. And the Dalai Lama's response was, you absolutely should go back and kill Hitler. And in fact, you should go do it with some fanfare because it's an important thing that you're doing. But no, you should absolutely not get uh, upset about it, not get um, angry about it, uh, because Hitler is simply a, a bad note in the karmic cause and effect 
Um, and, you know, it just, it didn't ask to be that way. It just was that way. Uh, it wasn't his fault. It needs to be stopped, but you don't need to hate it. You don't need to go on and, 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 um, and, and uh, to be enraged about it. Seneca, the Stoic philosopher, said that the reason you don't want to be enraged by things is because rage literally takes over reason. Um, it it's interferes with your reasoning abilities. And so you're like, even if your rage should be motivated, you're, actually unlike, you're likely to actually make a mistake, to act improperly, uh, to overreact, for instance, or to do the wrong thing because your reasoning faculty is not actually in control. Um, the position that rage is, or a certain degree of rage is sometimes, or, or, or uh, anger is sometimes uh, justified is Aristotle's position. And Seneca responds to Aristotle, uh, directly. Uh, Aristotle gave the example of an army. He says, you know, you, you, you want your soldiers to be a little bit upset, a little bit angry because they're going to fight better. And uh, Seneca's response was, well, by that token, uh, you know, it's known that soldiers go more willingly in battle also if they're a little bit drunk, but that doesn't mean you want a drunken army. And it's, a, it's the same kind of, uh, re uh, you know, reasoning. But there is plenty of disagreement on this. So I hear your position. Absolutely. Uh, there's, there's, this is definitely not a, a you, there's no unified position about this. It's just that the Stoics and the Buddhists, both of them reject sort of anger as a motivation. We should be doing the right thing because it's the right thing, not because we are angry. Uh, is there a Joel that is still the name, uh, the, the um, hand up? I have a couple more minutes and then I need to take a Yes, that's me. Uh, yeah, I, well, first of all, uh, thank you, Mitch, uh, for leading and for giving me this moment left over, uh, of left over time. Uh, I, for me, uh, what's most important uh, or more important is uh, doing the right thing rather than intending to do the right thing. Meaning well doesn't add up to much when, when you've done wrong. Um, and I'm interested in uh, struggle. Uh, I mean, it seems to me sometimes it's necessary to struggle. Uh, I've had to struggle in my life sometimes. Uh, but I've done a lot more of the easy things because I can do them. I often, I, I often fail at the things that I struggle with. So how, how, do, we, how do we look at uh, intent and, uh, and, and our impulse to do the small things, which usually turn out, uh, are more likely to turn out uh, the way we intended? So I guess the, from my perspective, I'm going to reject the premise. That is, I don't think that consequences are, are where we should focus. There are, it's, it is, the, the focus should be on intentions for two reasons. First of all, because intentions and consequences are correlated. You know, if I intend to do certain things for good that, and I know what I'm doing, you know, obviously, if I have knowledge of the situation, then presumably uh, it's more likely than not that the consequence is going to be positive. The second reason is because the consequences are, are less likely, you know, they're, they're not under my control. There's a lot of other things that can happen. I may, may have the best intentions and even act in the proper way. And then sometimes the outcome is not what was intended because there are other people involved, because there are uh, circumstances that are not under my control and so on and so forth. So consequences are not are, are difficult to predict. In fact, the more, the further down the, low, the, the road you go in the, in the chain of cause, in the web of cause and effect, the more difficult the consequences become to, to predict. You know, when utilitarian philosophers say, oh, uh, we should do whatever it is that maximizes people happiness and minimizes people pain, well, that's a nice sentiment, but how the hell do you know that? How long far the, 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 down the road you actually expand your uh, predictions of what is going to be making people happy or, or causing pain, you know, how do you make in those predictions? The, 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 the degree of knowledge of understanding that we have of, the, of cause and effect, especially in complex situations, it's really just not adequate. Uh, that's why I prefer the uh, uh, virtual ethical approach, which focuses on intentions rather than the utilitarian, the consequentialist approach, which, which focuses on consequences. Now, that is not to be understood as, well, the consequences don't matter. Of course they matter. The, the, the notion is that your intentions should be, should be good ones, should be the right ones, and 
that part of what you're doing is sufficient, not making sure you have sufficient knowledge of whatever it is that you're about to do so that you maximize the chances you're going to succeed in what you're doing, right? Otherwise, you're just a fool. Otherwise, if you, if you, you can have the best intention in the world, but if you don't know what you're doing, you are unwise. You're acting unwisely. Um, so, so that would be my, my response, uh, that, that it's not a, I don't think the consequences are the right focus uh, for these kind of discussions. Yeah, but you, you, the one thing you didn't address, uh, you know, may, maybe I should give priority to things that are easy rather than to struggle. Well, that depends. I mean, yeah, in general, uh, I think uh, we should always give priorities things where, to, to situations where we are likely to be effective. Yes. Right. So, for instance, my friend Greg uh, uh, practices, also practices both Buddhism and Stoicism, and he has become convinced over the years that um, paying attention to national politics is, is you know, a waste of time and a luxury. What you should do is actually be active at a local level because at a local level, uh, the your representatives are, first of all, much more likely to actually listen to what you're saying. You can call them up and talk to them. Um, your donations really do make a difference. Uh, in fact, in this case, it was a, a, able to even convince one of the local representatives to uh, fashion a, a particular bill in a certain way. So yeah, absolutely. Uh, and those things are easier and they're certainly more likely to get to, to give you a positive outcome than the, the, big, the bigger ones. So if you want to maximize the efficacy of your actions, yes, you probably should start with the low hanging fruits, basically. Um, but the problem is that sometimes uh, we do have large scale problems that we cannot ignore. You know, cl climate change is a problem we cannot ignore. We, we should do something about it. Now, I personally, or you personally, are not going to be able to do that much about it, but that doesn't mean we can afford to actually ignore, ignore the problem, right? So we have to find then ways in which we can have what Marcus Sergius was saying, the little effect. Little, yes, but it's an effect nevertheless, because then if more and more people... Uh, start being concerned about that kind of uh, big problems, then, then we can make some, some progress about those big problems. So yeah, I would agree with you in general that, that focusing on things that are easier and long, lower hanging is more satisfactory and more efficacious for sure. But I wouldn't think that we should concern ourselves only with those things because, uh, because otherwise we're going to be missing the big picture uh, and, and that's going to be problematic. All right. Well, we have got 30 seconds left of the break. Uh, I guess people should take.